It's, it originates from a Patricia Highsmith uh, novel called The Price of Salt originally and then renamed Carol about uh, following the lives of two women but really seen through the prism of the eyes of a, a, a young woman called Therese who uh, in the book is a set designer um, who has a relationship with a young man but uh, is in the process of finding out who she is really and trusting her own feelings and uh, sort of idolises and then falls in love with a woman called Carol Aird, who I play, who's in the process of getting divorced, has a young child, and obviously because it's set in the 50s, it's an incredibly um, uh, difficult terrain for, for the two women to connect and ultimately to um, consummate and live with their love. I'd read the book a long time ago. Uh, I was in a, um, fortunate enough to be in a film which Anthony Minghella directed of The Talent of Mr. Ripley years ago. And so I'd read a lot of Patricia Highsmith uh, then and was really struck by um, the, the power, the emotional power of, of the novel and, and how bold it was for the time in which it was written. It wasn't written in code you know, which a lot of those relationships were sort of encoded. Um, but I think the, the gift of, of working on something uh, based on a Patricia Highsmith story is that the interior life of the characters is so rich and she's uh, uh, masterful at dealing with characters who... Um, and acknowledging, in a way, that every adult has a secret and she sets them in the time that she was writing, obviously, in the 50s when it um, was very, very difficult uh, and nigh and impossible to trust people with those secrets. And that doesn't necessarily have to do necessarily with people's sexuality, but uh, in this case, in Carol, it does. The Price of Salt, when it was first written, was the first of the so-called gay lesbian fiction where um, there was a happy ending, where one of the characters didn't find the love of a good man or a good woman and, and uh, convert, reconvert into sort of heterosexual society or kill themselves. You know, it's, um, it actually has a, a positive uplift at the end of it. Carol is a shadowy character, um, subjectively seen through Therese's lens uh, in, the, in the novel. And I think the challenge that, that, um, uh, that, that Phyllis has risen to and achieved beyond my wildest expectations was by bringing Carol to life on the page and giving her her own heartbeat, not only through the person that Therese thinks Carol is, but who she might possibly be. And so therefore there's a lot of invention. There's a lot of uh, references made to lawyers' meetings and all of those stuff, but, that, but, um, but Phyllis has actually brought that to life with a real passionate, but you know, quiet dignity. Who is Carol? I think Carol, in a way, is um, she's someone with an incredible sense of um, pride and um, is intelligent and sensitive and aware enough to know the way the world works and that she doesn't fit within that world. But I think she f thinks she's found a way to operate um, that's intensely lonely, I think. I think it takes them both by surprise. There's a, um, <clears throat> a line or a description in, in the novel that, that Therese says is that she, she feels that her feelings for Carol are what she would have thought she'd characterise as being love. And she's heard of women who feel that way about other women, but she feels she doesn't look like those women, um, whatever that maybe she doesn't fit neat neither of them fit neatly into a a niche or a movement or a, or a, you know a social circle or an, an or in that time a, um, uh, an underground 
movement because of course those bars existed the, you know the literature the magazines those connections absolutely existed they always have but um, it was a subculture and so they didn't I don't think Carol or Therese have access to the language to describe those feelings or those relationships or the hopes and aspirations for those feelings in the way that we do we do now but so I think they're both ambushed by by their um, the intensity of uh, the connection with each other and see it specifically about that other person rather than fitting into a larger group. She's fantastic. I mean, we, we, we'd both worked with um, David Fincher and, and, and uh, Steven Soderbergh and had fantastic experiences and I, I knew how much both those men who I intensely respect and adore, adore Rooney, so I knew it was going to be great. But just how great and how open and how free and how... Um, she's just not phased by anything, you know, and really even, you know, in terms of her temperament on set, but then where she can go... Um, you know, emotionally and physically and psychologically. It's sort of that, that um, it really belies that ability. We, we'd actually done uh, a couple of days together on a Terence Malick film in, in Austin two years ago, a year ago. And so that was great. Um, this is a very different endeavour. He's gorgeous and uh, in so funny and so generous and um, I mean he you know he's a modern man but he looks so he's such a man you know not a lot of men in cinema but he's a man and and um, and had one with such heart and and he you know and and is not so full of ego that he can't be broken or fragile or um, full of shame you know all of those things which Harge is uh, you know experiencing so it's great to work with him again for a longer period He loves Carol deeply and Carol loves him deeply, but it just hasn't worked. And he's trying to put band-aids on it to, so that he's, he doesn't have to lose face with his family or lose face with himself or lose face at work. And they're all very human, relatable, um, understandable feelings that he's experiencing. And there's all sorts of reasons why this shouldn't happen. And Carol, you know, she's, she's had a child, she's been in a relationship, she's been out of a relationship, she's had um, fallen in love with a woman. I mean, she's had many, many experiences that Therese, simply by the product of her, her age and her own environment, hasn't been through. So I think that Carol thinks it's, you know, it's, if I fall headlong into this, I'm going to be falling in a different way than a, you know, a, a girl who is much younger than me. Because when you fall in love for the second time, and perhaps more profoundly the second time, you know what you're risking. And so therefore you know what you're, what you're in danger of losing. And I think that, that there's a kind of a, a melancholy, a wistfulness, a, a sense of, a different sense of apprehension that Therese just doesn't have or understand, but perhaps by the end of the film, she understands that loss, and which makes the potential of their love in the future, I think, even richer. What seems a ridiculous and obvious thing to say about a filmmaker, but he's so intensely visual, um, and the references that he brought to bear on this. I mean, he's, he's made films about sort of people who are on the outside or people who think uh, differently to the, the mainstream in one way or another, but he's treading visual terrain here that I've, I've never seen him tread. It's so, um, a whole lot of uh, uh, reflections. So you see the characters actually often recede within the reflection of the society in which they're inhabiting, the, the, you know, the taxis going by, the cabs, the passers-by. Um, so it's a, it's a very um, subtle, delicate aesthetic that he's uh, 
working with, but he's so buoyant and so full of feeling and good humor and um, and generous to to a fault, you know, to everyone on set. He's he's so wonderful to work with.